great to be here. Good morning from Singapore. And I am excited to share with you a bit about my research over the past decade or so on how to build habit forming products. Now, we've all seen what an amazing impact these devices can have on our day to day lives. And so, what I want to do is to share with you my research into how these companies who have touched the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions, of users and in the process made hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars, how they do it. What are the patterns that we see endemic to these products and services that are so good at getting us hooked? Hooked was my first book. It was all about how to build habit forming products. And it came out of a class that I taught at the Hassel Planner Institute of Design at Stanford University, as well as the Graduate School of Business. And so, what I want to share with you for the next few minutes is this pattern that we can use to help us build habit forming products. Now, this is not about addiction, it's not about getting people to do things they don't want to do, quite the opposite. It's about helping people build the kind of、uh, habits with your product or service that improves. Their lives. So, the definition of a habit is an impulse to do a behavior with little or no conscious thought. Amaz-、uh, imagine what would happen to your business if you could get people to use your product or service in a way that benefited them, in a way that enhanced their lives, to connect people together, to help improve their lives. Out of habit without having to spend all that money on expensive advertising or spammy messaging. Imagine if people had the impulse to use your product or service with little or no conscious thought as part of their day to day habits. How much better off would your product be? How much better off would your users' lives be if you could find a way to get them to use your product or service? Out of habit. And habits, I believe, are going to have a tremendous impact in improving people's lives over the next several decades. And that's why I've put my money where my mouth is, investing in companies, starting in Southeast Asia as well, but all over the world, companies that use habit forming technology for good. So companies in the ed tech space that help, ki-、uh, help kids get hooked onto online learning, companies in health tech that help people get hooked to exercise. Or eating more healthfully. Companies in the enterprise space that get people hooked to being more productive in the workplace. All kinds of ways that we can use habits for good. And that's what I want to help you do today. Now, what I discovered in my over 10 years of research was that there is a pattern to these habit forming products that designed into the UX of the world's stickiest products and services is what we call a hooked model. A hook model is an experience designed to connect your user's problem to your product with enough frequency to form a habit. Let me say that again connecting the user's problem to your product with enough frequency to form a consumer habit. And we know that there are these four basic steps to every hooked model we have a trigger, an action, a reward, and finally, an investment. So, there's a lot more that we have time to cover today in my book, Hooked. I hope you'll check it out. But what I wanted to give you was a very quick overview, a 30,000 foot overview of how we can use these four basic steps to make all sorts of products and services more habit forming, more sticky, the kind of products that can improve people's lives if they would only use the product and form a habit around it. So, I'm going to show you how to integrate these four basic steps into any product. That you want to turn into a habit. Not just a consumer web products, we're not just talking about the Facebooks of the world and the Twitters of the world. Any product that is used with sufficient frequency can be something that we can turn into a habit. Again, as long as the product is something that can be used with sufficient frequency. Now, what type of frequency level? In general, we're talking about a week's time or less. So if the product is not used within a week's time or less, very difficult to turn into a habit. But as long as the product's natural use is something that occurs within a week's time or less, we absolutely can apply these four techniques enterprise, consumer web, doesn't matter to build a habit forming product. Product. So let's dive into the triggers, the first step of the hook model. A trigger is something that calls us to action, it tells us what to do next. And we have two types of triggers. The first type of trigger is called an external trigger. An external trigger is where the piece of information for what to do next is in our outside environment. It's a ping, a ding, a ring, some kind of notification that tells us. 
community, we know all about these external triggers. We see them every single day. But what I find product people don't consider enough and what is actually even more important when it comes to forming a habit is what we call the internal triggers. Internal triggers are where the information for what to do next is not outside of the user, but rather inside the user's own head. So knowing what to do in response to being around certain people, certain situations, certain routines, certain places, and most frequently when we experience certain emotions prompts us what to do next. So a habit forming product, when a habit is formed, doesn't need an external trigger at all. It doesn't need those pings and dings. The user triggers themselves through what we call these internal triggers. Now, the most frequent internal triggers are emotions and not just any emotion, they are specifically negative emotions. So what we do when we're feeling bored or lonesome or indecisive or fatigued, what we do when we experience these negative emotions, what we turn to next with little or no conscious thoughts dictates our habits. In fact, we know that people who experience clinical depression check email more. Why would that be? Why would people who are experiencing clinical depression check email more? Well, it turns out that to escape what we call a negative valence state, to escape feeling the discomfort of these negative emotions, people will check email more often. Now, we don't have to be clinically depressed to know this is true. We use all kinds of products and services to escape feeling discomfort. Let me ask you, where do we go when we're feeling lonely? Well, many people open up Facebook or some other social media site. Where do we go when we're feeling unsure about something? Before you scan your brain to see if you know the answer, what do you do? You Google it, of course. And what do you do when you're feeling bored? You know, between two and four o'clock in the afternoon, you have that big project you don't want to work on right now. Where do you go? Well, many people will check YouTube or stock prices or sports scores or the news. Lots of things that we can do to escape this uncomfortable sensation of boredom. So the lesson here when it comes to internal triggers is that you have to be able to articulate what is your customer's internal trigger. If you and your product team can't tell me what is that internal trigger, what is the psychological itch that your customer or user is looking to escape, whether it's enterprise or consumer web, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's online or offline. You have to be able to articulate what is that psychological itch? What is that emotion that they are looking to escape the discomfort of by using your product or service? If you can't articulate it, you're just getting lucky. You're flying blind. So make sure you understand that internal trigger and that you prompt them with an external trigger at the right time to scratch that psychological itch. For the sake of time, let's move on for the next step of the hook model, the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest thing the user can do to get relief from that psychological itch. It's a scroll on Pinterest. It's a search on Google. It's hitting the play button on Youku or any other video site. These incredible simple actions done in anticipation of an immediate reward. Now, it turns out that there's a formula that we can use to predict the likelihood of any user behavior. This comes to us from a researcher at Stanford by the name of BJ Fogg. And Fogg tells us that for any behavior B to occur, we need three things at the same time. We need sufficient motivation, that's the M. We need sufficient ability, ability is how easy or difficult something is to do. And a trigger must be present. We just talked all about triggers. So let's talk about motivation and ability. Motivation is the energy for action. According to Edward DC, the father of self-determination theory, the energy for action, how much the user wants to do a particular behavior. And we know that there are these six levers that we can use to increase or decrease user motivation to make it for one of our users to do the design behavior because all of us as human beings, we seek pleasure, we avoid pain. We seek hope, we avoid fear. We seek social acceptance, we avoid social rejection. So every all the words on your landing page or in your app, every television commercial, every radio spot fundamentally utilizes these six key levers of motivation. 
Now, there's a lot more to be said about motivation, but for the sake of time, let's talk about ability. Ability is the capacity to do a particular action, how easy or difficult something is to do. One of the most fundamental rules of interaction design is that the easier something is to do, the more people will do it. So here again, we have these six levers of ability, these six factors that we can use to make a product or service more likely to be used based on how much time something takes to do, how much money something costs, how much physical effort is required to do that particular behavior. Brain cycles, this is a big one when it comes to the kind of products that we make in the tech industry, because the harder something is to understand, the less likely people are to use that product or to do that behavior. Social deviance says that we become more or less likely to do something based on what we see other people doing. And finally, non-routine says that we become more likely to do something simply for the fact that we have done it before in the past, because the more we do something, the easier it becomes, the more likely we are to do it again in the future. What do we call that? That's called practice, right? The more we do it, the easier it becomes. So we can actually use these three, uh, these three axes to predict the likelihood of a singular behavior occurring by plotting out for any behavior, any click, any purchase, any scroll, any action you want users to do, you always have to ensure that the user has sufficient motivation on the y-axis, high motivation, low motivation. On the x-axis, if something is easy to do, they have high ability on the far right of this graph, high ability, easy to do. If something is difficult to do, they have low ability. And if the user has sufficient ability and sufficient motivation, they cross that red threshold. And if and only if the trigger is present, then the behavior will occur every single time, online, offline, your behavior, your kid's behavior, your user's behavior, always requires sufficient motivation, ability, and a trigger. So if the user is not doing what you have designed for them to do, there are only three potential reasons. They lack motivation, they lack ability, or a clear trigger isn't present. So this is always what we look for if the action isn't happening. Now, the next step of the hook model is the reward phase. The reward phase is where the user gets what they came for. It's where that itch is scratched because of that action that they took. And we know that there is a way to supercharge these actions, that we can literally manufacture desire. Does anybody want to know how? Does anybody want to know how you can actually manufacture desire? It turns out that the unknown is fascinating. That variability causes us to engage, it causes us to focus, and it is highly habit forming. This comes from the classic work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. Skinner, back in the 1940s and 50s, he took these pigeons, and today we call these pigeon boxes, and he, I'm sorry, Skinner boxes, and he put these pigeons in his Skinner box, and he gave them a little treat. He gave them a food pellet every time the pigeon would peck at the disc. And at first, he could train his pigeons to peck at the disc every time he gave them a reward. Right? And so this is called operant conditioning, that we probably did something similar when you trained your puppy or trained your kids, maybe, kind of reward. By the way, interesting to note, the experiment didn't work unless the pigeons were hungry. Okay, So when the pigeons were hungry, they would peck at the disc and get a reward. He couldn't make the pigeons peck at the disc unless they were hungry. Just like you can't make your users do something they don't have an internal trigger for. If the user doesn't have that need, they're not gonna do the intended behavior. But as long as there is some amount of need, as long as there is that psychological itch, that internal trigger, you can prompt a behavior through what's called operant conditioning. Great, that's pretty basic stuff. But one day Skinner had a problem. He walked into the lab and he realized he didn't have enough of these rewards. He didn't have enough of these food pellets. And so he couldn't afford to give the pigeons a treat every time. He could only afford to give it to them once in a while. So that meant that sometimes when the pigeon would peck at the disc, no treat would come out. The next time the pigeon would peck at the disc, they would receive a reward. And what Skinner observed was, to his amazement, 
is that the rate of response, the number of times these pigeons pecked at the disc increased when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Why does this happen? Because variability spikes activity in a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, creating this desirous response, this one products and services, offline, online, enterprise, consumer web, you will find three types of variable rewards. What I call rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, and rewards of the self. Let me share these with you briefly. Rewards of the tribe are all about the search for social rewards, things that feel good, that have this element of variability, and come from other people. The search for empathetic joy, partnership, cooperation, competition, all of these things feel good, come from other people, and have this element of variability. Now, of course, this is the heart of what makes social media so engaging. So whether it's TikTok or Facebook or Twitter, or any other social media site, it's this uncertainty around what you might find when you engage one of these platforms. What's the next video going to be about? What are the comments going to say? How many likes did I get on something? All of these are examples of variable rewards of the tribe. Next come of the hunt. Rewards of the hunt have to do with our primal search for food, material possessions. And in modern society, we find this type of reward with information rewards. So when many people think about variable rewards, they think about slot machines, right? When somebody plays one of these games of chance, there's uncertainty around what they might find when they interact with one of these platforms. Now, interestingly enough, we see the exact same psychology at work online. Right. So when you use LinkedIn, for example, when you scroll that feed, maybe the first story is not that interesting. The second story is not that interesting, but maybe the third or fourth story is interesting. And so what do you have to do to keep seeing more interesting con content? You have to keep scrolling and that scrolling and scrolling use the exact same psychology as pulling on a slot machine. Both variable rewards of the hunt searching and searching for that next interesting bit of content. Finally, we have what's called rewards of the self. Rewards of the self are all about these things that feel good, that have this element of variability, but don't come from other people and aren't about the search for material or information rewards. These are things that feel good in and of themselves. They're intrinsically pleasurable. So the best example I can think of online is gameplay. So when you play, I don't know, Candy Crush or uh, uh, any other online game, you're not necessarily playing with other people. Many of them you're playing by yourself. You're not even really winning anything in terms of material rewards, but there's something fun about getting to the next level, the next accomplishment, the next achievement. And even if you say to yourself, yeah, but you know, I'm a very serious business person. I don't play these kind of games myself. I bet you you play this game every day. This look familiar? Your email inbox? There's something variable about what you might find every time you open your email inbox. What's gonna be there waiting for you? Is it good news? Is it bad news? Clearing those unread messages. What about your to-do list? Checking off all those little boxes or what gets me every day is that one notification on my home screen that I just have to open to clear it away. These are all examples of these variable rewards of the self the search for mastery, consistency, competency, and control, all variable rewards. And so the point of the variable reward phase is to give the user what they came for, to fundamentally scratch that psychological itch, but have a bit of variability, a bit of uncertainty around what they might find the next time they engage with our product or service. And finally, the last step of the hook model, and probably the most overlooked and most important of the four steps of the hook model, is what we call the investment phase. The investment phase is where the user puts something into the product to make it better with use so that they are more likely to pass through the hook on the next time around. And the way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is in two ways. The first way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass is by loading the next trigger, by loading the next trigger, something that the user does to bring themselves back, not some piece of spammy marketing messaging, no, something that I did to bring myself back to the product or service. So what might this look like? 
When you send someone a message, for example, on WhatsApp or Slack or any number of other messaging services, when you invest in the service by sending someone a message, there's no immediate gratification, right? You don't get any points or badges or there's no leaderboard. Why do people do this? When you invest in the service in sending someone a message, you're likely to get a reply. And that reply comes coupled with, what's this an example of? That notification, that meatball icon that you see on, on the app, that is an example of an external trigger that prompts you to go through the hook once again. So something that the user does to bring themselves back. That's an example of investment that loads the next trigger. The next type of investment that increases the likelihood of the next pass through the hook is called stored value. Now, this is a really, really big deal because in the history of manufacturing, in the history of, of designing, manufacturing products and services, most products and services lose value over time. They depreciate, right? So when you think about your car, your clothing, your furniture, all of these things made out of atoms as opposed to made out of bits, they lose value with time. Uh, they depreciate. However, habit-forming products should do the opposite. They should appreciate with use. They should get better and better the more we use them because of the investment that users put into the product or service. This is a really big deal. So how, do how does the investment phase do this? Through content, for example. The more content you upload to a site, so for example, the more content I put into the Google Cloud, the more it becomes my, my cloud storage solution. The more data I give to a company, so for example, mint.com, the more data I give to a, a, a platform that takes care of my personal finances, the better it becomes for me. It becomes more and more valuable the more I put into the service. The more followers someone has on a social media site, for example, like Twitter, the more valuable it becomes a way to reach their audience. So if tomorrow Twitter were to say, hey, uh, Twitter's not free anymore, okay? You have to start paying for it. Who's more likely to pay? Someone with 10 followers or 10,000 followers? Of course, it's gonna be the person with 10,000 followers because they've stored all that value in the form of their follower count. And finally, reputation. Reputation is a form of stored value that users can literally take to the bank because your reputation on sites like Upwork or eBay or Airbnb increases over time. It becomes more and more valuable. So if you have a great rating, if you have a great reputation on one of these platforms, it's kind of hard to leave, right? It's kind of sticky, even if a better product or service comes along. So it's these four fundamental steps of a trigger, an action, a reward investment. It's through successive cycles through these hooks that customer preferences are shaped and our tastes are formed. So if you are building the kind of product or service that requires repeat engagement, if you want people to use your product or service out of habit because they want to, not because they feel they have these four, I'm sorry, these five fundamental questions of number one, what is your internal trigger that your product is addressing? What's the consumer's psychological itch? Number two, what's the external trigger that prompts the user to action? Number three, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward? Is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And then finally, what's that bit of work done to increase the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. So by answering these five fundamental questions, if you're just getting started with your product, answering these five fundamental questions with just a pen and paper will save you countless hours and perhaps millions of dollars going in the wrong direction but by making sure that you have built in this habit into your product or service. If you've already built your product and service and you're wondering, hey, why don't people come back? Why aren't people forming a habit? You can use these five fundamental questions and these four phases of the hook model to diagnose where your product or service might be lacking so you can fix it on the next go around. Now, before I go, there's one more thing I wanna discuss, which is of course, the morality of manipulation that many of you might be thinking, hey, is this okay to do to people? Is it all right to get them to do what we want through our products and services using their hidden psychology? Is that okay? And if you had that kind of question, I say bravo. I think that is the appropriate response to learning about the power of habit-forming technologies. Because let's face it, any type of design, okay, any kind of design is manipulation. Whether it's user interaction design, whether it's interior design, 
all design is about manipulating people's behavior. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's unethical because there's two kinds of manipulation. We have what we call persuasion and we have coercion. Persuasion is helping people do things they themselves want to do. Coercion is getting people to do things they don't want to do. So persuasion is perfectly ethical. If we can help people live happier, healthier, more productive lives through the technology they use by building healthy habits, wonderful. Coercion, on the other hand, getting people to do things they don't want to do, not only is it unethical, it's bad for business. People aren't stupid. If they wake up and say, hey, I didn't mean to do that. That's not something I intended to do. Not only are they going to stop using your product, they're going to tell all their friends to stop using your product. So we want to make sure we use these techniques for good. Because fundamentally, our technology, this is something we use in bed every single night. It's something that we use first thing in the morning before we even say hello to our loved ones. So we have to make sure that we use these techniques to help people live happier, healthier, more productive lives through building, by building good habits. And so let me borrow from the words of Gandhi to encourage you to build the change that you wish to see in the world today. And with that, I would love to take your questions. Uh, if you could do a, a quick favor while we take some questions, we have a, about 10 more minutes, which I'd love to, to take your questions. If you could do me a quick favor and go to this URL as, you, uh, as I answer the questions, it's opinion2.us. Notice it's not.com, it's opinion2.us. If you have your phone handy, you can just point it at that QR code and it'll take you to a very short survey. Uh, we'd love to know what you thought of the presentation. Just five quick questions, take you 30 seconds. And if you do that, you'll be given a link to my SlideShare page where you can have all the slides you just saw. Feel free to keep them, share them, whatever you'd like. If I don't get to your question today, please check out my website, nearandfar.com. The URL is right there. Near is spelled like my first name, N-I-R. Uh, so nearandfar.com. There's a contact form there. Feel free to send me a question later on if we don't get to your question today. And with that, let's take some questions. <laughs> 